All right. Let's start it off. So a couple of different women's health topics, focusing on hormonal therapy. We've already touched on some other things like um, you know, osteoporosis and other areas that kind of fall under women's health sometimes, but definitely affect men too. Of course, oral contraceptives being female-specific product. Uh, okay, so about 80 million women use oral contraceptives. They're super I don't know if that's worldwide, I can't remember. Anyway, stats don't matter. <laughs> Highly reliable form of contraception. So if you take uh, an oral contraceptive, when correctly, about 0.1% uh, chance of pregnancy with perfect use. However, studies show that the average person has about an 8% chance of failure because they don't take them correctly or they miss a dose or something like that. Um, more consistent methods like depo injections or IUDs, of course, much more reliable. Anytime you take out that patient compliance factor, you're going to improve your odds. You just have to remember that that person has to come back for the next depo injection or they have to get their IUD replaced every few years depending on which product they get. Um, rings and patches like the uh, Ortho Evra patch and the, um, shoot, what's the ring? NuvaRing. Um, those have varying rates and actually they're about the same as oral because people mess them up just as much. Um, you might think they, they would be a little bit more convenient and for some people they certainly are but they certainly have their issues as well as far as compliance and, and little tricks here. Uh, most of the products on the market today that are used contain both a progestin and an estrogen compound and hormonal contraceptives. Uh, as far as their dosing, they used to be really high doses of hormone, comparatively speaking to what the products we're looking at today are. They've just gone lower and lower and lower. That's kind of been the the new area of study with these over the last couple decades is how much hormone do we really need to provide contraception and can we get by with a lower dose and have less side effects so that's the whole idea here uh, this is just a comparison chart in case you're curious compared to like condom use versus uh, a number of other things on here versus no method at all basically this is if you look at this if 100 women um, you know are sexually active during a year and they don't use any method, the odds of them getting pregnant is about 85% chance. And then, you know, if you have one of these methods on board, of course, the IUD being um, uh, the uh, least likely to fail as far as all the different methods. But you can see, like, again, patches, pills, the uh, vaginal ring, aka the neuter ring, all about the same. Again, if you use them correctly, they're all pretty much the same efficacy, very, very effective, but correct use is the big thing there. Can't really incorrectly use an IUD. All right, so the estrogen component is relatively straightforward. Ethanol estradiol is the estrogen component in pretty much every oral contraceptive on the market, at least the current ones anyway. Uh, it was discovered in the 30s. It's been available for quite a while and used therapeutically for you know almost a century at this point. It's uh, standard dosing is about 30 to 35 micrograms. I'm not concerned you know that, but I wanted to give you that as a baseline because the products that are marketed as low, like orthotricycline low or low, low estrin or those other products that are low, um, have different variations of that. And usually it just means if they're a low marketed product, it means they have a lower amount of estrogen. In this case, ethanol estradiol's dose is going to be a little bit lower per pill. So that's the big difference you're getting at there. Um, the progestin component, there's a lot of them. There's norethindrone. Um, norethindrone acetate, yada, yada. I'm not going to go through all of them. There's tons of them. And this is going to be the variable one. So all the different brands probably have a slightly different uh, progestin component in it. Um, how do you tell which one it is? Well, they'll all have ethanol estradiol in it, and then they'll have uh, progestin products. So that's how you can figure that out. Um, also have residual androgen activity. Uh, so all progestin hormones are derived originally from testosterone. Um, some have more testosterone related effects than others. So when you're talking about side effects and you're looking at the different progestins, some of them are going to be uh, more androgen heavy than others. And that's a way you can differentiate between the products. So if you're trying to decrease, for example, somebody has is getting acne on their oral contraceptive, you could decrease them or change their product to a, a lower androgen formulation. That might help with that side effect. Really, all these products are basically the same. I don't want you to know a ton of differences about them. However, I do want you to be able to classify them in your head uh, for the purposes of just going out into the real world and prescribing them. So classification of progestins uses combined. So again, we have different generations of them available. Unclassified, like drosperinone, and I'm going to talk about this in a little bit more detail by itself, is Yasmin or Yaz. It's the um, progestin component in that product, and that is considered anti-androgen. <clears throat> so where all these other ones probably have some degree 
of androgen activity. And generally, the older they are, the higher amount of androgen activity they're going to have. These newer ones, like drosperinone, have anti or no androgen. I don't know if I think anti androgen is a little bit of a marketing scam, but um, neutral androgen activity is kind of how I would say it. And again, here's a better classification <clears throat> for the androgenic uh, compounds. And it, again, this is just really important from a side effect perspective. These are all going to work the same way. They're all going to provide contraception. At that point, it's really about figuring out which one works best for your patient. They might need to try a couple different ones before they find the, the one that is best for them. Okay, let's talk about some mechanism of action stuff. Estrogenic mechanisms suppress hypothalamic gonadotropin releasing hormone and pituitary gonadotropin secretion. <laughs> They inhibit mid-cycle uh, luteinizing hormone surge, basically preventing ovulation is sort of the core behind how these drugs work. Um, the, together, they have uh, a nice synergy. Um, there are progestin-only pills that don't have the estrogen component, which I'll talk about in a second, why we might use those in certain cases. Uh, and they just don't prevent the ovulation component as much. However, they are somewhat effective on their own. Um, suppression of ovarian follicular genesis and suppression of ovarian steroid production. So you see there's actually a number of different mechanisms just on the estrogen side alone. Most of them, again, focusing on preventing release of, or preventing ovulation. The progestin side of things have more effects on the endometrium, so it renders it less suitable for implantation, uh, which can cause atrophy over time, and that can cause spotting and things like that for patients. We'll talk about how we can dose and, and change to, to prevent that here in a second. But um, alterations in cervical mucus, decreased permeability to sperm, and impairment of normal tube motility and peristalsis, so the eggs are not as likely to move correctly um, and get actually to the site of implantation. So again, uh, adding on to our estrogen mechanisms, we have a number of other things to do. So birth control pills work. In, in, I think there's about seven different mechanisms of action if you all count them up and take the technicalities into consideration. Uh, this, everyone's probably done this in physiology at some point, so I'm going to skip it. But in case you're wondering where all these hormones line up, here we go. Uh, okay, so let's talk about the drugs in general, how people take them. All right, so generally speaking, quick start, first day of last menstrual period. Uh, if it is five less than or equal to five days ago, start the method today. Use backup method for one week. If it's more than five days ago, take a pregnancy test. If you've had unprotected sex since then, then you stratify it that way and kind of go down the chart. Uh, basically, there's there's two what I think are main options or kind of standardized options. Sunday start, where you start the pill on the first Sunday after the person's period begins, backup contraception for seven days. Or the first day start to begin pill on the first day of menses, and backup contraception is not needed at that point. Either way is fine. Again, this stratifies it out a little bit differently. It includes the things like pregnancy tests and questions to ask. So. Um, very straightforward. It's not very complicated, and the algorithms are pretty well defined. So if you ever go into prescribing practice, where you're, well, obviously you guys would be in prescribing practice at some point. I'm thinking pharmacist in my mind. Um, but what you guys would be doing is, I mean, some places might have these built into an electronic medical record. Uh, other places you might have to kind of do it on the fly, depending on where you're working. But again, it's pretty straightforward how to prescribe it. That's why a lot of states, well, not a lot of states, some states you're seeing actually um, these products going to more behind-the-counter status. Oregon's done this, and I think it I can't remember who else is. California maybe is looking at it. Anyway, that pharmacists can actually prescribe these if they meet the criteria. So basically, if you work for a Walgreens, Walgreens would probably install some sort of algorithm where you ask your patient these questions and they can get it. Depending on how you feel about that, I'm not sure. I'm kind of neutral on pharmacists prescribing oral contraceptives. Part of me thinks it's great access to medicine. The other part is like, should all pharmacists be doing that? Eh, hopefully they have an opt-out if they don't feel comfortable. Anyway, you'll see some of this. And just, again, it's fairly simple and straightforward. There are some contraindications to consider, but those are pretty straightforward too. All right. Uh, so how you start other contraceptions, comparatively speaking, you know, just in case you're wondering, um, a variety of these things are available to patients, so how would they compare to what we just talked about? A lot of them are the same type of concept here, usually backup method or abstinence for a few days after getting the, um, the IUD or the implant put in. Uh, oral contraceptives packs all kind of look the same but are different in marketing. People have made them look pretty or different colors or however you want to describe it. Uh, pretty much they all have um, 
28 days, which is common. Sometimes you'll see ones that just skip the placebo altogether, like a 21-day regimen. Usually the white ones are left in as placebo. So this would be the day put in. So you take your placebo and you end up having kind of a lighter version of a period, and then you'd start your pack again after those seven days. Some patients prefer to have a less frequent period, so they might go three cycles without taking that or four cycles sometimes. And some pack, some products are packaged that way too. Um, certainly, if, if a patient doesn't want to use the placebo, they don't have to. Um, just make sure that they have enough refills in the day supply matchup because they could end up getting off when they're filling their prescription. So if you prescribe like a 28-day supply, patient wants to skip their placebo week, you know, for the first three months or something like that, just, you know, make sure you guys are on the same page with that. Um, different products have different cyclic type properties as far as how they um, alter in the uh, hormone doses. So for example, this is orthotricycline. And you can see it's called tricycline because there's three different cycles of hormones. So each week you actually take a different amount. The idea here is to, to overall give you a lower exposure to hormones throughout the course as opposed to using a fixed dose. Again, no less effective, just might be better tolerated by some patients. Uh, okay, so normal use. What? So when I talk about normal use giving you uh, less than 0.1% chance of failure, what does that mean? Take at the same time every day and don't miss doses. That's pretty much all there is to it. There's a couple other little things here um, that we'll talk about, but that's that's the basics behind it. Um, missed pills, a single missed pill, you want to take it as soon as you notice it, even if it means taking two pills together. You don't need any additional contraception. Two or more missed pills, take one missed pill as soon as you notice, then continue regular schedule. Uh, pills are missed during 50, days 15 to 21 of a 28-day pack. Finish them. Uh, start a new pack, skipping the placebo pills altogether. Backup contraception for seven days. Take an extra pill. Just keep taking your regular schedule. Don't worry about it. Don't skip a day. Um, return of menses. Within 30 days after stopping the pill, most patients will have a return of their normal cycle. If not by 90 days, they might need to follow up and get special treatment for that. Um, the moral of the story is if somebody's really nervous and can't really remember if they missed a couple, I mean, hopefully they'd be able to tell them the pack, but they might not for sure know if they missed a day or not or where they did it. They might be on kind of an off-week schedule where it doesn't really make sense or didn't line it up correctly. Anyway, if they can't figure it out, um, seven days backup contraception is never a bad thing to recommend for somebody. Most people can, figure, can, can suffer through that or using backup or abstinence for seven days is the end of the world for most people. So. Not a bad strategy if you're worried. All right, I talked about 21 versus 28-day cycles a little bit already. Um, mono versus multiphasic, I talked about that already. And again, I don't really have much more to say than that. Again, usually the as far as the hormone levels or hormone doses, usually the uh, estrogen dose is fixed and the progestin component is the variable part in that. So like orthotricycline, as a brand name, would have a fixed amount of estrogen and a variant progesterone product. Orthotricycline low would have the same concept of progestin, but a lower fixed dose of estrogen, if that makes sense. Um, there's no proven clinical benefit for a multiphasic product. It just, again, it exists maybe to, to offer an alternative to people. I'm not saying it doesn't work. It just, um, as far as clinical trials go, there the jury's still out on whether it's actually better or better tolerated for people. Side effects vary widely based on the type, dose, and route. The most common side effects, estrogen causes bloating, nausea, and breast tenderness. Usually this subsides over a few months after a person starts taking them. Uh, venous thromboembolism is probably the biggest risk with these. That It's going to be the most common serious side effect you see. So higher estrogen doses are associated with increased risk of VTE but the risk is prevalent uh, with both low and high doses. Um, older and heavier women are at higher risk. Thrombophilia disorders, like people with factor V Leiden, are at higher risk. Uh, very low risk in young, healthy women. It's about 3 to 13 per 10,000, lower than pregnancy or postpartum periods too, which I think gets about 70 per 10,000 for pregnancy postpartum. So the risk is there. It's really quite low. It's very close. Like if you look at the low end of this, like 3 to 5, it's pretty close to the general population risk. So it's almost, you know, it's slightly higher, but it's still a pretty low risk at getting it. Um, other side effects, weight gain. People, like, I think that's a common myth, more or less. It's uh, inconsistent data on whether oral contraceptives exclusively cause weight gain. There are some studies that show that some of the progestin-only products are more likely to cause weight gain than the combined products. Breakthrough bleeding, the most common side effect of oral contraceptives, for sure, for most women. They're going to reflect a breakdown in the endometrium, conversion into more fragile, thin, atrophic state. Uh, atrophic state. Uh, possible causes, missed pills, lower estrogen doses. 
Um, estrogen stabilizes the endometrium. So if you start somebody on a low product or a low branded product or a low estrogen component, and they have a lot of breakthrough bleeding, an easy fix to that is putting them on a higher estrogen dose product. So switching them from whatever low product they're on, like if they're on orthotricyclin low, switch them to regular orthotricyclin. That's an easy change that shouldn't have a huge side effect impact. Yes, you could argue that their VTE risk goes up very slightly with that, but at the same time, it's still really low and they're probably not going to um, argue too much over the, the decrease in breakthrough bleeding. Stroke risk. Um, extremely low in healthy women under age 35 to the point where we really don't think about it a whole lot. Slightly higher in women over 35, and then it gets st statistically significantly higher if you're over 35 and you smoke. That becomes a contraindication. So if you have a patient who's over 35 and they're a smoker, you probably shouldn't be prescribing them birth control pills. Um, and it's a good chance to say, look, I can't prescribe you this unless you stop smoking, so use it as some leverage. Let's figure out a quit plan. You guys get the rest of my message here. <laughs> uh, higher risk with migraine headaches. Uh, so if you have migraine headaches and we're at any age, it's higher risk. And I believe it's contraindicated for those patients as well. Myocardial infarction, uh, mixed studies, likely extremely low rates of MI. So really it's the VTE we're worried about. Again, the stroke risk with smoking and age is, and, and migraine headache are the two kind of things to remember. Uh, and then myocardial infarction, there's no contraindications that I know of for that. All right, let's talk about these anti-androgen things. Okay. Drosperinone, a.k.a. Um, is branded in Yasmin was the first product. Yas is the kind of upgrade to it, which just means it has a lower dose of estradiol. It's the only difference between Yasmin and Yaz. Uh, and Bayaz is the newer product. It's the same thing as Yaz, but it, so again, it's a lower estradiol component. It has the same progestin, the drosperinone. Bayaz has like a folic acid analog in it. The, the, I don't know, I roll my eyes at this one a lot. It's a total marketing scam. The idea here is that if you happen to go off your birth control or get pregnant while you're on birth control or something, you have a lot of circulating folic acid available and you're not, not likely to get deficient. Guess what? Prenatal vitamins do the exact same thing and you can buy them for $10 over the counter. Um, it's, a to, it's a total, I don't know. I don't know what they were thinking, but again, marketing scam. Uh, associated with greater VTE risk when compared to levonorgestrel. So this is, levonorgestrel is a more common, older, um, non-antiandrogen, so it's more of an androgen uh, causing, a side effect related causing progestin. And they showed that VTE risk was slightly higher with these trosperinone products than with the other ones. Why? We don't really know for sure. Uh, but the risk was really still small and quite a bit lower than pregnancy. I mean, if you look at that range from 3 to 13, you're talking about like maybe you know, within that difference. So it's not like it was way higher than what we'd expect from oral contraceptives as a whole. It was just on the higher end. And when they looked at all these people taking these drugs together, they were able to find it was statistically different for people on drosperinone products. So again, you might have heard in the news like people suing Yaz or the company people that made Yaz. It's still super popular, probably one of the most popular oral contraceptives on the market. And it's really the only anti-androgen one. So if that's a big side effect concern, that's the way the benefits and the risk is the slight risk of VTE appropriate for your patient if they're going to maybe relieve some of their side effects. That's a question you'll need to talk to with your patients. So, uh, marketed as causing less bloating, acne, weight gain, and helping with, um, like, what do they call it? Menstrual dysphoric disorder or something. I don't know. They basically made up their own disease, which now is kind of a real thing. At the time they did it, everyone was like, what are they talking about? Because they, they sort of did something. It was, what did they talk It's dysphoric PMDD. PMDD. Thank you. Yes, I forgot what it was. Anyway, so they marketed it as that, and they've actually gotten FDA approved to treat that specifically. Um, at the time, again, it wasn't really a, a thing that existed, and it sort of became a thing now. Uh, anyway, um, so... Like I said, I wanted to spend a little bit more time just because these are really popular oral contraceptives. I'm not trying to be against Diaz in any way, but there are some things to think about with it. Uh, just to review all the contraindications, so age over 35 and smoking more than 15 cigarettes per day, multiple risk factors for cardiovascular disease, uh, hypertension that's uncontrolled, venous thromboembolism history, thrombogenic mutations, again, things like factor V Leiden, um, Known ischemic heart disease, history of stroke, valvular heart disease, lupus, migraine with aura, breast cancer, cirrhosis, hepatocellular adenoma, and malignant 
hepatin, hep, hepatoma? Yeah. Anyway, so some cancers, most of it's related to the thromboembolism stuff, and then cardiovascular related issues tend to compound the stroke risk and those VTE risk factors. All right, drug interactions. Um, oral contraceptives are SIP metabolized, so anything that inhibits or induces your SIP system is going to have some issues, potentially. Um, generally speaking, inhibitors are not a big deal. The one that I probably think of the most is common is going to be your azole antifungal. So if your patient takes a fluconazole dose for like a, a yeast infection, is that a one-time thing going to have a big effect on their clinical impact of the way that their drug's being metabolized? I don't know. I think if the jury's out, I think a one-time dose probably isn't a big deal. And you usually just get higher serum estradiol concentrations anyway. So it's not like it's going to decrease the efficacy, which is why we don't really care. Especially for mild or moderate, you're just going to get a slightly higher ethanol estradiol level in the bloodstream. So yeah, maybe if somebody's on a stronger inhibitor or even a moderate inhibitor, like if they're on an antidepressant that inhibits or something like that, they take regularly, um, maybe a low ethanol estradiol product would be more appropriate than them because it might give them kind of a standard uh, dose like they, like they would get if they took a full strength product. Um, enzyme induction is a little bit more concerning because it might decrease efficacy. So you want to make sure your patients are aware if they're taking any of these drugs. Again, most of these aren't super common. <clears throat> Antibiotics, probably the most common thing that comes up a lot. Um, studies show that these are pretty much okay to use with oral contraceptives, and there's really not an issue with them. It is a bit controversial, and the reason is because um, all sex hormones undergo enterohepatic recycling. So the GI bugs, so your, your body excretes hormones in the bile, GI bugs fix them and make, so, make them so that they can get reabsorbed. They kind of recycle that way. And if you wipe out the GI flora, the thought is, is that you decrease the ability to do that. So in that case, you need to consider a backup plan. At least that's the theory. Uh, this has been tested a lot and not been proven. It's a theoretical interaction. If your patient's worried, it's certainly worth talking about them. You know, you can, again, always recommend backup contraception if somebody's really worried. And it's, a, again, a theoretical interaction. Um, some people think that it's more related to the cytochrome P450 system. But again, most antibiotics are probably going to inhibit um, the, the enzy enzymatic activity, not induce it. And therefore, we'd probably just be worried about increased hormonal concentrations with that, not necessarily decrease. So it's really about the GI tract flora, and that's the mechanism behind why people are concerned about it. And again, the studies haven't panned out to show that there's any diminished efficacy with the oral contraceptives with antibiotics. Certainly, again, backup contraception might be worth talking about and recommending for most patients, just so they're aware of it. Um, St. John's Ward, if somebody takes that for antidepressants, we haven't talked about supplements yet. It's a, uh, it's a product that's somewhat clinically indicated for mild to moderate depression. It's got some evidence behind it. Um, it's over the counter, so some people might take it. That would induce the SIP system, possibly decrease in efficacy. I'd recommend not using it with oral contraceptives at all because it's, it's unknown what exactly dose you're getting, first of all, if you're buying an oral or you're buying an over-the-counter supplement. And then you don't really know how much impact there is. There's not good evidence to say what dose is appropriate, what's safe. So I'd recommend just avoiding it altogether. Um, a lot of HIV drugs, to interact and, and have um, various inhibition and induction properties. So making sure that if your patient is HIV positive and they're taking medications for it, they understand their risk. And you do your homework to figure out which ones might be less likely to interact. OK, non-oral hormonal contraceptives. Uh, the NuvaRing is a combined contraceptive. It's ethanol estradiol and etonogestrel, I think, is how you say that. Anyway, it's used intravaginally. It's a ring, um, and it's inserted once weekly for three weeks and then one week without. Uh, if you remove it, you can actually uh, just rinse it with warm water and reinsert it, and you actually get a three-hour window before you lose any efficacy. So if somebody wants to take it out for whatever reason, like if they're having intercourse or w whatever you might want to, or a doctor's exam or something like that anyway, or some people say they fall out, I don't know. Um, if that happens, again, rinse with warm water, put it back in, you got your three-hour window. If you didn't notice it fell out and spent a whole day, then that's another issue. Um, recent controversy, so this one's another one that's gotten... Um, some press lately and some lawsuits because it's on the higher end of the VTE risk. Again, you're talking about the upper end of that 3 to 13 range. Merck is the company that makes this, and they had a pretty large settlement, uh, a class action suit against them uh, on not disclosing that it had a higher VTE risk than its oral counterparts. 
The Ortho Evera patch is another product, and it has a lower dose estradiol. However, because it's transdermal, you actually end up with about 60% higher exposure. So people think that that increases the VTE risk. There's another reason why people think that the VTE risk is up on this, because it's not oral. It absorbs um, intravaginally into the systemic circulation at higher rates, and you end up avoiding first pass metabolism and things like that. Ortho Evera, one patch every week for three weeks, then a one week patch free. Not recommended for use in patients over 198 pounds. Poor absorption and decreased efficacy. Why 198? Why not 200? I don't know. <laughs> it's weird. Uh, in case you've never seen these products or are unfamiliar with them, this is basically how the, the ring works. It kind of sits upright by the cervix. Um, the patch can be applied in multiple areas, specifically places that you wouldn't really see on a daily basis, or even if you were wearing a swimsuit or something like that, you could keep it covered up. Um, Non-oral hormonal contraceptives continued. We have Depo Provera, which is a progestin-only product. So this is um, medroxyprogesterone. It's an IM shot once every three months. It's got no estrogen component to it. It's got the highest weight gain associated with it as well. Um, it's cheap, so you might see this in patients who don't have good access to health care or good resources to support some of these other more expensive products, maybe no insurance coverage. Um, so sometimes they do this in like free clinics and stuff. Again, it gives you three months. Uh, so even if you don't follow up to the clinic, you at least have a, a good window to, to figure something out potentially. IUDs, you have the Levo norgestrel releasing ones. There's Mirena and Liletta and Kylina and Skyla. <laughs> so you get all these great names with these products. And the oral contraceptives all have really great names too, like Porsche and I don't know. I feel like they just pick random like... You know, it's like they have a, a book and they Google like European women name and like figure it out and put it on. Anyway, uh, so in order of decreasing levonorgestrel release, these are all basically the same thing. They just have slightly varying amounts of hormone that they release. You have 20 to 19.5, uh, 17.5, and 14 micrograms per day. So Mirena and Loletta are essentially the same thing, very slightly differently. Think of Loletta as sort of a generic of Mirena, but technically it's not. Uh, so there's very few contraindications to IUDs. The reason is because the reduction in menstrual, uh, you actually don't absorb very much um, hormone at all. You absorb a little bit. And um, you also have, uh, as far as like things like people with a migraine, generally it's thought of that somebody could use one of these. Uh, but I would stick to maybe the lower end ones. If you had somebody on the contraindication and they wanted an oral con or a contraceptive, it could be... Um, appropriate to prescribe them something like the Skyla, and even the Marina is probably okay. Um, you know, there, there's not necessarily a lot of data to support what I just said, but I think that's pretty commonly done in practice, since that's what Jeannie told me a while ago, so I'll take her word for it, since she does this a lot more than I do. Um, significant reduction in menstrual blood loss and dysmenorrhea. 75% um, of women will still ovulate on this, uh, but it's very hard to have any type of successful pregnancy due to the placement of the IUD and uh, the way that the, um, the endometrium is, uh, is not suited for implantation. Um, approved for about five years of use, and they might be able to work longer than that, but usually every five years is when you replace them. Uh, the copper IUDs can be left in place for at least 10 years. People usually have a heavier menstrual cycle. Um, they're directly, I'm trying to think of this word, ovulocytal. <laughs> they kill the egg. <laughs> What's that word? Anyway, so they, if the, the egg comes in contact with the copper component, it's directly, copper is bacterial cytal too, so kind of a similar property where it destroys the egg basically on contact. You can also use copper IEDs as an emergency contraceptive too. If you have an embryo that's possibly, so post, it's not done very commonly, but like post-sexual assault or something like that, they do use a copper IEDs sometimes. If somebody wants a more permanent solution, for at least the, the you know the immediate future, um, you can you can put a copper IUD in and it will terminate a pregnancy, similar to like a Plan B pill or something like that. All right, this is my funny picture for the day. I was googling like things to show a size comparison for how big an IUD is, and I found somebody with that photoshopped someone. I think that's Photoshop anyway, right? Not real IUDs on somebody's tongue, uh, but that's about the size comparison, uh, what they look like, in case you're curious. And then here's the mechanisms of uh, uh, action with them. You do not eat them. <laughs> well, you could, I guess. Probably be pretty uncomfortable. Um, hormonal, and that's like a $2,000 thing you just swallowed. Um, hormonal contraception uses benefits outside contraception. So certainly you can be on 
a contraceptive of some kind and not necessarily be using it for contraception. So how do people take these and what other therapeutic benefits do they have? Hyperandrogenism, people with this, it usually happens due to polycystic ovarian syndrome. It can counteract some of those effects. Now I just told you that some of the progestin products have androgen-like activity, but compared to what these patients usually have, it, it has a, a functional antagonist effect, especially with the extra estrogen from the estrogen estradiol. Uh, dysmenorrhea, menorrhagia, hypothalamic amenorrhea, a couple other things on here. Acne, even uh, it's got these have lots of different indications for use, and so it just depends on your patient what they want it for. Uh, ideally, you have somebody who's looking for a contraceptive and has one of these things in place to, to get you know two therapeutic uses out of one drug. Um, I'll talk about decreased cancer risk very briefly, and we'll talk about this more during uh, in the second part of this lecture. But endometrial, ovarian, and colon cancer all have significantly decreased risk with oral contraceptive use uh, over several years of use. And so if you have somebody who has like really high family history of one of these, that might be a reason to give that to them prophylactically potentially. Um, not that that's a specific FDA approved use, but it is a possible use. Again, if somebody's looking for contraception and they have a high history of family ovarian cancer, maybe that makes sense. Use during lactation, so if somebody has baby and they're in the postpartum period, can you start one of these products? Um, so hormones are excreted in the breast milk and may pose a risk to the infant, um, in addition to estrogen decreasing overall milk production. So usually estrogen is not recommended in postpartum women. So we tend to go with things like A, a barrier method is simple. There's no hormones involved with that. If the patient doesn't want to do that. Uh, progestin, a progestin only product like the mini pill is a progestin only pill. It's the only non-combined oral contraceptives, it's just progestin, and it doesn't really appear to affect breast milk production, but does have quite a bit of breakthrough bleeding because we don't have that estrogen to help stabilize the endometrium. Um, Depo-Provera injections are fine too, uh, and then IUDs. So for a patient who is, you know, with a, a long-term partner and wants to get back on something, um, you have to wait a little bit, four to six weeks postpartum until the uterus kind of gets back into shape, and then you can uh, insert it. Otherwise, if you do it too early, you can possibly perforate the uterus, and you definitely don't want that happening. Emergency contraceptives. Uh, candidates, recent unprotected intercourse or contraceptive failure. Um, High-dose progestin is the, the product that was on the market first called Plan B, which is levonorgestrel. Uh, basically just a higher dose of what was already available in oral contraceptives. So um, could you take several oral contraceptives to make that dose up if you were in a pinch? Yep, certainly can. Uh, and you'll get the same effect. Uh, so Delays ovulation. Uh, it's much less effective in obese women. The higher the weight, it diminishes efficacy substantially. So it's a really important consideration if you're thinking about prescribing one of these. Um, plan B is over the counter, which makes it accessible to a lot of people. Um, the other product that's newer, that's the one we prefer to use most, mostly now, is Eulopristol, or Ella is the brand name of this. And some people just call it Plan C because they think they're funny. Um, I'm one of those people. Uh, prevents progestin from, and I don't like saying Ella. I mean, that's like a cute girl's name, and they kind of named, I don't know. There's a lot of girls named Ella, and it's like, that's that's unfortunate. I don't know. Uh, bad choice of naming, in my opinion. Anyway, so it prevents progestin from binding to the progesterone receptor and delays ovulation. It's actually not hormonal directly. It has more of a, um, it's just a, it's an analog that acts as an agonist. Um, data shows efficacy for up to five days with no diminishing returns. So that's one interesting thing about plan B. Basically, you kind of tick down the further out you get from the unprotected intercourse event. And then with Ella or Eulopristol, you don't have that same thing. It's pretty much efficacious for five days uh, equivocally, which is great. Um, data showing better efficacy in patients over 80 kilos as well. So for those reasons, we don't use plan B. Like if people come in for sexual assault or AD, we don't even, plan B is not a thing we carry even anymore. We just, we use Eulopristol for every patient. Um, copper IUD, 95% effective within 72 hours. So again, this is something that could be placed. Copper IUDs are going to be expensive. They're going to require somebody who knows how to put, put a copper IUD in. Any urgent care doc and nurse can facilitate the uh, taking of a pill. So that's pretty easy. Um, so if the, again, if the person uh, wanted longer term 
protection or uh, contraception, I should say, not really protection, um, then they would have uh, that option to just stop it, the pregnancy from occurring. Yes? Is Eulip Fentanyl over the counter or not? Gosh, I don't know. I should look into that. I don't think it is, but I'd have to double check whether that's gotten through or not. And then approximately what percentage is the Oh, man, when I worked retail, I feel like it was like a hundred bucks a dose without insurance. Um, I don't know for sure. Something around there. It's not cheap, but then again, there's a lot of generic equivalents out of it right now. So I assume that it's covered by a lot of plans and then also the cost has come down quite a bit. Oh, NSAIDs, yeah. I put NSAIDs on there. NSAIDs can possibly work as a contraceptive option, too, in an emergency situation. Uh, misoprostol is a form of NSAID that uh, is used sometimes in acute situations. It's If you give it in really high doses, it will cause an abortion as well, so it is kind of like known as the abortion pill. Um, and so taking high-dose NSAIDs is thought to have an emergency contraceptive benefit. Not recommended to tell people to do this. So I just put that on there as a thing. Yeah, just take your whole bottle of ibuprofen and we'll talk. Not a, not a great plan. All right. Let's take a quick break and some different delivery techniques and different reasons for using them. Of course. Oops. All right, I messed this up here. There we go. All right. All right, so let's talk about menopause a little bit. 95% uh, of all women will experience menopause between 45 and 55 officially designed a cessation of menstrual periods for one year of time, usually looking at vasomotor symptoms, which would be commonly referred to as your hot flashes, um, night sweats, sleep disturbances, also uh, vaginal atrophy and mood swings, symptoms most prominent during the last two years of the perimenopausal phase, and hormonal replacement therapy uh, has some risks and benefits to it. I think it was really commonly used when some of these products were first developed, and um, it's been shied away from a little bit for some reasons, but we'll talk about it here in a second why that is and what other options we have for people who don't want to use hormones but have some of the symptoms. Okay, so menopause hormone therapy. Um, basically, again, we're looking at kind of this uh, perimenopausal period and sort of the tail end or the middle of menopause when people are usually going to take uh, uh, or consider a hormonal product. Usually post-menopause, like kind of once they hit that trough here, if you want to call it that, they're going to not really need anything. So if you do prescribe hormone therapy, excuse me, it should only be for a couple of years at most. Um, Long-term HRT is not usually recommended or indicated for most patients. It's really effective at stopping the vasomotor symptoms, but again, I said there are some risks and we'll get to those in a second. So again, perimenopausal women, uh, moderate to severe vasomotor symptoms, and uh, no history of breast cancer, cardiovascular disease. If you just have vaginal atrophy without the vasomotor cons um, component, you can use a local vaginal-only uh, hormone that can relieve some of those symptoms fairly effectively without really having much systemic impact. Benefits of estrogen therapy. So estrogen therapy relieves genitourinary atrophy. It relieves vasomotor instability. may improve sleep by reducing hot flashes as well. Um, osteoporosis associated with menopause, a reduction in hip vertebral fractures by 25-50%, depending on the study you look at, and reduced rates of resorption. It doesn't restore existing bone loss, but we talked about this briefly during osteoporosis as an option for patients. And this would be the category of patients you'd consider this in, the uh, perimenopausal woman. Postmenopause probably doesn't make a whole lot of sense to use an estrogen product. Probably stick to either a SERM, like a selective estrogen receptor modulator, like a VISTA, or raloxifene is the generic of that, and then, or um, you could consider uh, other products as well, like uh, bisphosphonates. Um, cholesterol, CHD, uh, there was some studies out there that thought that this would lower your LDL and raise HDL. However, um, even if it does that to a substantial degree, which is controversial in and of itself, it's not been shown to lower um, uh, any type of heart disease risk. So um, we'll talk about the Women's Health Initiative here, which is a big meta-analysis, looked at a number of women's health-related issues and whether uh, there's a big focus on hormone therapy and how it affects those different issues. So I'll, I'll go over that as sort of a summary here in a minute. Mood changes. Um, Estrogen will help to stabilize some of those, and sexual, sexual function uh, will help with vaginal atrophy and, and therefore would decrease intercourse-related pain. Okay, flip side of the coin, endometrial cancer, risk increases with unopposed estrogen. So if you give somebody just estrogen alone, especially if they have an intact uterus, uh, it can increase the risk of cancer substantially. So if they have a history of endometrial cancer, 
Um, you should avoid estrogen altogether. In a woman with a hysterectomy, estrogen is fine. There's really no risk or a single estrogen product. If somebody has an intact uterus, you don't use just pure estrogen. You're always going to use a combined product. The progestin part of that uh, help, helps to balance out some of that risk, and the risk almost goes down to nothing. Almost. Uh, breast cancer, uncertain risk with unopposed estrogen may increase relative risk by about 25%. That's relative speaking to the general population. So still not a huge amount of people per year. And it's not uh, as well understood as endometrial cancer, but it is thought to be an increased risk. If you do have a history of breast cancer, it's recommended, or a strong family history even, it's recommended to avoid unopposed estrogen therapy. Um, cardiovascular outcomes, we'll talk about the Women's Health Initiative, so hold on to that in a second. I'll show you a bunch of things about that. Uh, general adverse effects that aren't as serious as long-term cancer, uh, bloating, headache, breast tenderness, uh, which we talked about already with the oral contraceptives. Unpredictable uterine bleeding if unopposed. So again, for people with an intact uterus, an unopposed estrogen doesn't make a whole lot of sense. Okay, so women's health outcomes uh, or, or women's health initiative outcomes, what they looked at is a number of different things like heart attacks, breast cancer, strokes, blood clots, hip fractures, colon cancer, and dementia, and whether or not uh, conjugate estrogens and medroxyprogesterone. So they actually used a combined product here, so an estrogen plus this synthetic progestin. In women ages 50 to 79, primary prevention of cardiovascular disease. Um, there's some controversy because of the, that older women are already at higher risk for some of these things too. So, you know, what is actually relative to like a younger patient is healthy. But anyway, it's, it's good data that they looked at, I think. So you can see um, some of the different risks that they have. Um, and what increase? So heart attack risk, breast cancer risk, stroke risk, and um, blood clot risk all increase somewhat substantially. Um, hip fractures decreased, colon cancer risk decreased, dementia was increased. Um, there was an over 65 specific dementia trial too. So again, a lot of reasons why taking these medications should have some cautious red flags in your mind. But the nice thing is, is you aren't taking these for the rest of your life. Hopefully these would just be used as a temporary stopgap until menopause is complete. Some patients might find they like the effects of them, though, and they want to keep on them. So kind of weaning them down might be a tricky thing. Um, but looking at some other alternatives as well. Again, if, they're, if they kind of get over that perimenopausal phase, the vasomotor symptom issue shouldn't be a big deal. If they still have things like the vaginal atrophy, you could recommend a, a topical product that they could use occasionally, and that should reduce their risk of virtually any of those. Benefits, risk of adding progestin. So your benefit is decreasing risk of estrogen-induced regular bleeding, protection against breast carcinoma, enhancement of estrogen prophylaxis and osteoporosis. Um, you do get some more adverse effects and unpredictable ble bleeding within the first 8 to 12 months of therapy which could be the entire course of therapy, depending on the woman. Hormone treatment. Uh, so many products are available. So you have, again, you're talking about delivery route is the first thing you want to consider. What are your actual symptoms? If they're systemic, vasomotor, consider oral. If they're just local vaginal atrophy, consider a vaginal product. Unopposed estrogen therapy may cause endometrial hyperplasia and cancer as soon as as little as six months into therapy. So even so, we're using a short term, it's still shown that the risk does increase with even a small amount. So <clears throat> again, does a couple years increase it substantially? Where's the cutoff in the Women's Health Initiative? I think a number of the studies looked at varying different uh, amounts of use, but it is still a risk regardless of how long you're taking it. So for that reason, combination products for any woman with an intact uterus. I've said that about three times so far, so hopefully that's gotten into your head. I'll probably say it a couple more times. Um, products available on the market, you have a number of different preparations, and compared to oral contraceptives, it's a little bit more, uh, what I want to say, diverse um, with respect to there's lots of different patches, there's different gels, there's emulsions, sprays, vaginal rings, which we have. So a lot of these things are found in the oral contraceptive world, but there's more options and more dose variability with some of the transdermal options specifically and some of the um, non-oral products. So um, this is estrogen only on this side, I think. Well, some of these are. Sorry, I shouldn't say that until I read this. One thing you'll notice is that the estrogen on this isn't always ethanol estradiol. So we're with our, uh, our oral contraceptives, ethanol estradiol is always estrogen. This one will depend on what it is. So the dosing isn't one-to-one. -one. So that's a question I've gotten before. Like, oh, this is 1.25 milligrams of estrogen. Is that the same as ethanol estradiol? Ethanol estradiol is a lot more potent in and of itself. So like Premarin, for example, which I'll talk about, is actually conjugated estrogens isolated from 
pregnant horses, believe it or not. And um, these other ones are more synthetic, though. There's a number of different types that are available. And some of them do have ethanol estradiol. So, for example, if you look at this Gintelli product, 5 micrograms per dose, which is substantially lower than an oral contraceptive. So, theoretically, um, lower doses overall uh, with the estrogen product, but um, similar risks, what, we, what we're seeing as far as VTE go, maybe slightly lower. So your different choices are unopposed estrogen, estrogen plus a cyclic progesterone, and estrogen plus continuous progestin. So similar to your oral contraceptive options there with the cyclic versus non-cyclic. And I really don't have much to say. I'm not going to test you on the differences, just to know that there are options like that. You know, it kind of depends on uh, what types of experience or symptoms the patient's experiencing. Usually, you might change it due to um, the irregular menstrual cycles people might have. They might just ha find less breakthrough bleeding and things like that with a cyclic product, versus the um, which mimics physiologic hormone production a little bit better than a continuous product. That's probably the biggest reason to change if you're going to. Uh, monitoring and, uh, oh, if you're going to give an intermittent program, some of them are estrogen plus intermittent progestin, which is continuous estrogen daily with like a three-day progest progestin, three days off. It's rarely used anymore, but I thought I'd just include it in case you ever see it. Monitoring, monthly self-breast exams, annual mammography, pelvic exam, evaluation of vaginal bleeding are kind of the standards. <clears throat> Duration of therapy, use lowest dose, uh, check symptoms after three months and one year, discontinue once somebody's asymptomatic or um, basically once they kind of get beyond what you'd consider the menopausal phase, if they've been on it, they're probably still going to have some residual symptoms. So once those all fade, hopefully they will over time. Basically, you should never have anyone on it more than five years, and five years would be kind of a stretch for a lot of people, unless they started it really early and had a longer, more delayed menopausal period. Okay, so what if we don't want to use hormones since they cause cancer? Uh, Non-hormone options, selective serotonin and norepinephrine reuptake inhibitors like venlafaxine, fluoxetine, proxetine, sertraline have all been studied. Um, there's a lot of rebranded products in this realm too. So like Brisdel is, I think, a proxetine rebrand. Serafem's a fluoxetine rebrand. Basically, it's like they said, well, Prozac, when it came out, took their fluoxetine and dosed it at 20 and 40 milligrams, and we're going to come out with Seraphem and give it a 25 milligram dose and maybe say it's like delayed release or something and, and rebrand it and charge people like triple the price. It's stupid. Um, just prescribe the generic fluoxetine. Uh, don't waste your time with any of these weird brand names because it is exactly the same drug. Um, if you prescribe Seraphem, a pharmacy might actually do send the patient home with like a few hundred dollar prescription. So uh, it's just it's a marketing scam kind of like um, our friend Bayaz that we just talked about. Um, again, exactly the same. Just go with the closest dose, and you can always dose titrate with fluoxetine if you want to. You can do a 10 and a 20 or 220s or however you want to do it. You should be able to find a dose that works. Any are probably okay. Um, if you compare them to a therapeutic antidepressant dose, they're usually dosed a little bit lower, so maybe like half of what you would see for the standard person taking it for depression. But it doesn't mean you can't go up. If you wanted to go up higher to like a standard depressant, Antidepressant dose, that's fine too. There's no contraindication to doing that. Just generally speaking, you don't need as much. And the studies were done with lower doses. Uh, herbal or natural products. So beyond antidepressants, which are kind of the mainstream of non-hormonal options, uh, these ones are commonly used. I would say maybe commonly is not a great word. But anyway, um, soy isoflavones are similar effects to conjugated estrogen. Uh, basically, it's kind of like has an estrogen-like effect in the body. Uh, so if you're looking at a non-estrogen product, that's probably not a great choice. Um, evening primrose, primrose oil is sort of an old wives' tale that has no actual clinical evidence behind it, and there's no mechanism that I can tell you. Black cohosh has, is an herb that has some effects on the uterus. Um, it is somewhat effective in clinical trials. Um, dosing, it's tricky. I'll talk about supplements in, in a few weeks, but the basic gist behind supplements is um, most of them have no standardization behind their doses. They don't get uh, approved by third party man uh, third party regular regulatory bodies. So you could buy a supplement that's 100 milligrams and it could have nothing in it. It could have 1,000 milligrams in it. The bottom line is no one's checking that to make sure unless the company is going out of their way to do that. Very few actually do. So the problem with supplements is it's very hard to get a consistent dose with them and to therapeutically treat somebody when you don't actually know what you're giving the person. Anyway, I'll talk about that a little bit more um, in detail when we talk about supplements. But bioidentical hormones, um, compounding pharmacies might use these. Basically, they purchase the hormones. I believe they're isolated from P3 
people. I'm not 100% sure in this product, not necessarily like animals, like Premarin, um, but they have similar, similar effects to CE, which is conjugated est equine estrogen, which is the product that's in Premarin. Um, other products, clonidine, magestrol, gabapentin. Um, so clonidine uh, and gabap clonidine works by um, helping with shut down some of the sympathet sympathetic nervous system components that might be thought to be behind the vasomotor symptoms that people get. Um, magestrol is megase. It's sort of like a, a hormone antagonist type thing. I'm not going to talk about it a lot. It's not very common. And gabapentin, why not, right? We use gabapentin for everything, so we might as well try it for this. There's no logic that I can see behind using gabapentin, but again, it's used for pretty much everything from restless legs to psych conditions to seizures and whatever. Um, all right, lots of mixed data on those ones. I wouldn't necessarily recommend any of them. Oh, and I'll just say that like, um, if you compare SSRIs to hormonal therapy head-to-head, -head, hormonal therapy is better at what it is supposed to be doing for this particular condition. It's going to help with those vasomotor symptoms more so. You can combine the two too. So if you wanted to get by with maybe a lower dose and try an SSRI, you can certainly do that. There's no contraindication to giving the two together. Uh, but just know that you aren't getting the best therapy with this. But then again, you aren't getting any of the risks associated with the other ones. So take it for what it's worth. Uh, breast cancer. I know we already talked about oncology. I know it's super specialized, but breast cancer is um, very, very common in the cancer world. So let's just spend a couple of minutes talking about it quickly. Again, most frequently diagnosed of all cancer types, leading cause of cancer-related death in women, leading cause of death in women ages 40 to 49. Um, <clears throat> lots of di disciplines combining here, so we'll just focus on the drugs quickly. I'm not going to test you on breast cancer other than um, kind of knowing just being able to understand some of the hormone-related things, but some of the non-hormone stuff, like the chemotherapy portions that we already covered, don't worry about that. Okay, so stages one and two um, has some different options we can do. And again, I'm not going to test you on any of this stuff, so don't worry about it. After you usually control it with some sort of chemotherapy, and whether you did surgery or something along the lines of one of these cyclic therapies, whatever you did, if you get the breast cancer cured, usually you manipulate the hormones for a few years afterwards to prevent the regrowth of it. The idea is to the hormones are feeding the cancer somehow and to manipulate them to the point where they can't uh, feed those tumors, even if the tumors do try to regrow. So how do we manipulate those? Estrogen plays an important role in hormone receptor positive breast cancer as an adjuvant or in metastatic disease. Um, so tamoxifen is one of the most common drugs used. It's a selective estrogen receptor modulator or a serum binds to tumors and other target tissues, or other, <coughs> excuse me, tissue targets, decreases DNA synthesis, inhibits estrogen effects, also competes with estrogen for binding. So basically, if you remember back to your um, oncology mechanism, it's going to cause cells to accumulate in the G0 and G1 phases. It's not a cytotoxic agent like our standard chemotherapies. It's an important distinction there, but it is cytostatic, so it will prevent those cells from progressing to a further phase, which is effective, of course. So if you didn't get every single last cell during your um, resection or whatever you did surgically, or not everything got cleared, but most of it got cleared with your um, chemotherapy regimens, this is to prevent those remaining cells, if there are any, from growing over the next several years. It's very cheap as far as chemotherapy goes. Tamoxifen has been around a long time. It's actually what, what we'd consider kind of an affordable chemotherapy, which unfortunately you can't say that very often. Um, side effects, as you might expect, you get things all over kind of the estrogen, hormonal-related spectrum, things we've already talked about. So um, if you are close to menopause, interestingly enough, you can actually induce menopause. Uh, if you had breast cancer, that's a contraindication for hormone things, so just keep that in mind too, right? You can't give somebody Premarin to, to compensate for that. Uh, these drugs aren't perfect. That's the only reason I have this on here. We could probably do a lot better with some of this research, but um, kind of what we have right now is really where it's at. Um, I just really want you to know tamoxifen. Um, the rest of this gets a little tricky, and we'll come back to some of this stuff during um, the uh, what am I trying? prostate cancer as well, because some of the aromatase inhibitors are used there as well. So um, they prevent conversion from androgens to estrogens, so you can manipulate hormones in men with them as well, depending on the effects you want, ultimately. Uh, these are really expensive, and they're usually started after a course of tamoxifen is complete. So the, the way it goes is they'll start you on tamoxifen for maybe a year or two, depending on what your risk is or how they want to prescribe it, and then they'll start an aromatase inhibitor after that. They don't always do both, but um, it's an option. Some other things. 
uh, that I'm, again, not going to test you on or talk about. You can suppress gonadotrobin-releasing hormone. Uh, you can, there's a direct estrogen receptor antagonist called fluvestrant, which causes dose-related down-regulation of estrogen. It's a once-a-month IM injection that's about $2,000 a dose. So again, we're getting into the much higher cost tiers with this, whereas our tamoxifen is a cheap, kind of reliable thing. Three and four, palliative. Um, certainly, the hormone part of it will still come into play but there's a lot more considerations with this type of breast cancer with advanced metastatic disease. So, And I just wanted to touch base on that very briefly, uh, and that's all I've got for you today. Uh, quick lecture. We'll talk about um, pregnancy, peripartum stuff next week. I'll do it online, and then we'll meet in person for pediatrics following that. Yes? I have a question. Is the estrogen estradiol or the... Ethanol estradiol? Yeah, thank you. Is that the one that's... Like from no, that's conjugated equine estrogen.